Hello and welcome to Wigtown Wednesday. I'm Andrew Castle and this is the latest in a series of talks with authors made possible by the generous sponsorship of Bailard, uh, Bailey Gifford. This evening we're considering what I suspect many with unionist sympathies will consider an apocalyptic uh, manner outlook in life and that is when or how Britain ends. That's the title of a new book by the respected broadcaster, journalist and writer Gavin Esler. In it, he argues English nationalism is making the prospect of Scottish independence and Irish unity almost inevitable and is stoking support for Welsh separatism. Further, that our much vaunted sense of Britishness has atrophied to the point that it can no longer hold the people of Great Britain and Northern Ireland together, and that our obscure and outdated unwritten constitution without reform is simply incapable of resolving the ambitions and aspirations of the peoples of the home nations. Gavin himself is a Scot. He's a Glaswegian with strong family links to Ulster Unionism. He's lived for many years in Wales, England and the US during the course of his highly successful career. And we're delighted Gavin can join us this evening. Welcome, Gavin. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Andy, and welcome to everyone who's, who's joining us virtually on Zoom. And I wanted to, to start, first of all, I mean, these sound like weighty issues and, and we'll get into them soon enough, but uh, the obvious question really, and the simplest question really, what prompted the book? There were two things uh, that made me write the book. Uh, the first was a challenge to unionism, as you rightly suggested there. And the challenge to unionism is this, what does the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland mean in the 21st century? Um, it has been invented and reinvented every century since 1603. It's based on three pillars, all historians agree, Protestantism, empire and war. So in 1603, the Union of the Crowns was to find a Protestant king for, for England and Wales as well as, and it, they found it in Scotland. A hundred years later, it was worries about the French. A hundred years after that, it was still worries about the French. It was Napoleon. Then by the 20th century, uh, when it was reinvented uh, in 1922, that was after one war with Germany and as we led into another war. And the 20th century, as you know, ended with the, the Cold War. All these things were part of the glue of unionism. So I simply ask, what is it about now? What is unionism for? What do we mean by being British when many surveys suggest that actually more of us in Scotland identify as Scotland and Wales identify as Wales and in England in particular, many more people identify as England, English first. And there's always particularly in England been an elision between being English and being British and a confusion which sometimes annoys people in Scotland and elsewhere. But frankly, you know, I, I grew up as Scottish and British and European and it never worried me. The other challenge is to nationalists, which is particularly in Scotland. What does nationalism, what does independence mean in an interdependent world? And we've seen how difficult it is to break uh, a kind of union with the EU, which has lasted less than 50 years. So what do you really mean by changing the union of the United Kingdom? What, what would be the, the future be? So those are the two big things. And then there were two anecdotes really uh, deriving from post-Brexit Britain, as, or at least post the 2016 vote, it's obvious that bits of the United Kingdom are going separate ways. You know, Scotland did not want to leave. Uh, some people did in Scotland, but predominantly Scotland wanted to remain. Northern Ireland did too. Um, uh, England wanted to leave. And when in August 2019, I was at the Edinburgh Book Festival and I was talking to a lot of friends, that's where I went to school in, in Edinburgh, uh, many of whom would be, I would think, small C conservatives uh, who voted no to independence in 2014. There was a real resentment that they felt that they had been lied to or betrayed by what we know in Scotland as the vow, the idea that, you know, uh, if you stick together with the United Kingdom, that's the way to stay in the European Union. And if you don't, you'll be out and out on your own. And it struck me then that many of those votes, if it ever came to another independence referendum, were ones that the SNP would target, obviously. Remainers then in Scotland who were 
very upset. And one friend of mine actually said, you know, who, who speaks for the United Kingdom now? I mean, who, who does speak for unity? Which is the big political voice? And when Boris Johnson says, I'm a one nation uh, Tory, he means that one nation is England. And that really stuck with me. A couple of months later, October 2019, I was in Northern Ireland where I've got a lot of friends, a lot of family, and I've lived there very happily uh, for a while. And uh, it was two days after Boris Johnson effectively drew the customs border in the Irish Sea after his meeting with Leo Varadkar at the Wirral. And I was with uh, friends who were unionists and friends who were uh, nationalists too. Um, but the unionists were really, really angry and quite upset that in their view, a hundred years of Ulster unionism had been thrown under the bus um, of Brexit. And one said to me, Mrs. Thatcher used to say Britain, sorry, Mrs. Thatcher used to say Northern Ireland is as British as Finchley. Boris Johnson has made us as British as France. So those, those were the dynamics that led me to, to, to write the book and to try to pull together the various threads and ask, what does being British mean in the 21st century, if anything, to many people? And if, you know, are you saying in effect that that, that sense of Britishness no longer exists? And if so, when did it die? No, I'm not saying it no longer exists, but I'm saying it is much diminished. And it, to many people, it is less significant in their lives than it was before. And it's not, Brexit, for example, uh, is both a symptom and a cause of the changing tectonic plates within the United Kingdom. And within England in particular, there's always been a confusion between being English and being British. Let, let me give you a great example. I mean, uh, I love this quote from Cecil Rhodes, that great British imperialist, as we would call him. But Cecil Rhodes said about 120 years ago, um, ask any man on earth what he would rather be in 99% would say he'd rather be an Englishman. Now, even when, when Cecil Rhodes said that, <laughs> I don't think in a pub in Glasgow <laughs> or in Belfast or in Cardiff, people would have said it. It's a very um, uh, English nationalist thing to say, not that British nationalist. So that that elision, that, that there remains a, a degree of Britishness in Northern Ireland, for example. Um, both Protestantism, Protestantism, empire and war is still celebrated by Orange Order marches and to an extent in the west of, of Scotland. But generally, that kind of glue of Britishness has gone. Uh, we share islands, we share common language, but what, what does it actually mean? Does it, is it necessary to be British? And if so, do we not need to think about why it, for many people, in, including in England, it's not quite working, that things are not quite COVID aside, are not quite working very well. And you use the example of, of Cecil Rhodes, but I mean, there are plenty of examples, Scots certainly, and uh, the Irish and, and the Welsh, I'm sure, can come up with plenty more recent examples of, of how the establishment, what we might call the English establishment, regards itself as the British establishment. I mean, prime ministers um, regularly can elide the two, don't they? Yes, yes, they do. And uh, we're, we're meeting on St. Patrick's Day. And I suspect many, if there are many people with an Irish background, they would they would agree whole, wholeheartedly in that. And look, in a, in a way, you know, my father was in the British Army. Uh, he didn't mind when people said you must be an English soldier. He, he was from Glasgow. He did mind secretly, but he didn't complain. It was no it was no big deal. And there's always been there's always been for every nationalism a kind of unpleasant side uh, and and people in England in particular have tended to be slightly embarrassed many of them about the the English flag it, it was confined to football matches for a long time but in the last 20 years that's changed and many of the surveys from the IPPR the, the um, uh, policy uh, institute uh, and others suggest that uh, being English or identifying in, in English, in, in being English, is a much stronger strand in England now. And this is, the government in Westminster is trying to do something about it by talking about levelling up and the, appealing to, to the Red Wall and, and so on. But some of it would appear to be a kind of resentment about devolution itself to Wales and, and Scotland. And that probably led to the Boris Johnson comments, which were then somewhat regretted that devolution has been a mistake, which is not generally how it's seen 
in Scotland and Wales. And Northern Ireland is a slightly different case, but generally people like the idea of having reasonably local control of local issues. And uh, I'd like to come on to that in a moment, but just to finish this thought of, of Britishness for a moment and, and where it's gone, if you like, do you think that illusion, if you like, that, that um, you know, what, what many have regarded as British is in fact English, are there any aspects of, of Britishness left, perhaps monarchy? Would you say? Yes, that? I mean, well, I, I go through at one point, what are British institutions? And we all think of, of the monarch, and certainly, uh, and but even uh, uh, in Alex Salmon's vision of an independent Scotland, the Queen was going to remain head of state. The Queen is currently head of state of Barbados. So does that, you know, uh, Barbados is not British. So <laughs> I'm not sure about that in a, in a way, uh, even though that's the way it's seen here. Um, the NHS, but the NHS is very significantly devolved. Um, uh, as, as you know, there, there are not, there's not one chief medical officer. There's four, one for Scotland, one for Northern Ireland, one for Wales and one for England who advises the, the, the government. There's no one university or education system. There's no one legal system. A lot of things are very different in different parts of the country. And there's no reason why that should not be the case. But I quote in the book, there's a lovely quote from an English historian uh, David Edgerton, who I admire greatly, and it's a very wry quote about, uh, about English attitudes to, to, to nationalism. And he says, nationalism in British parlance was the doctrine which encapsulated the dubious claims of natives, whether Indian, African, Irish, Scottish, Welsh. So he leaves out deliberately English because he said it's not quite the, the, the thing in England. So it's slightly different. It's always been slightly different. And it's always been elided with Britishness, which is a much more inclusive um, idea, which is why, again, many of the surveys I quote in the book suggest that people of colour in the United Kingdom are often quite happy to say I'm a British Asian or, 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 or whatever it is, but they're not so keen on saying I'm an English Asian. And it's interesting whether in Scotland, people of an Asian background are prepared to say or happy to say I'm Scottish Asian, I'm Scottish Asian. So there are little differences which may not mean much, but they do add up to different senses of identity and different senses of identity quite often lead to different political aspirations. And that sense of British identity, I wondered, do you think it really died with the, with the empire going? Because it was very much a British empire. I mean, we very rarely recall it, the, the English empire, do we? Well, I think, I think Britain did something quite remarkable after the war, which was to decolonize without breaking up. And, and it was handled magnificently, actually, uh, when, you th when you think back in it. Think how difficult it has been for Russia to get rid of the Soviet empire. It's still a real uh, problem. Turkey with the Ottoman empire, it's still a real problem. Empires are very, very difficult to uh, withdraw from. And Britain, by the creation of the Commonwealth and so on, has done some quite magnificent things. But we were also held together by the threat of the Soviet Union, of Soviet communism. And we had, a, you know, Dean Acheson, the US Secretary of State in the 1960s said, Britain's lost an empire, but has yet to find a role. Well, the role we found from the moment he said that, which was the 1960s, was a closer relationship with our European partners. And now that's gone. And now the obvious, at least, um, you know, we've seen the defense review from the government, but there's no overt threat to Britain of warfare, I hope, and we all hope. So what, is, what does that leave us apart from nostalgia? And very much of what we, what I talk about in the book is this backward looking, take, take back control. Well, what about taking forward something? You know, uh, what, why, is it, why is there such nostalgic pessimism about something we've lost? What is the invention, the positive invention of Britishness from the future? And, you know, um, in, in 1939, a, an obscure Labour politician, Arthur Greenwood, appeared uh, in the House of Commons to speak about the Polish the invasion of Poland by the Nazis. And on the Tory side, Leo Amory, quite a right wing Tory, said, speak for England, Arthur. And Arthur spoke for England, actually. And he spoke for Britain. And he spoke for people in Scotland. He spoke for the British Empire. And it was a good thing. But who does that now? And I can't think of anybody in... Uh, in politics now, who active politics now, who, who does it? You might say Gordon Brown and some others, but they tend to have moved on from the active politics of the past. So it's very difficult to see who's making the case beyond nostalgia for Britishness. 
And, and do you see this elision between Britishness and, and Englishness? Do you see that the start of a process which led inexorably to Brexit, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears to me you suggest that, that the Brexit vote was in fact uh, a, a, an expression of English nationalism alone, really. Well, as a, as a friend of mine in Ireland said, and I quote this in the book, it's like an old joke, isn't it? An Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman go into a pub. The Englishman wants to go home, so everybody has to leave. Well, that's that's been the story. That's been the story of Brexit. I mean, it's 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 a fairly obvious one, isn't it? Particularly in Scotland, when you are told in 2014, this is the only way to stay in the EU, you stay in the UK, and and it hasn't happened. It's going to make you think again about Westminster. And one of the themes in the book, I know we might get onto this about mm. more positive things we could do in the future, but Westminster is just such a flawed system with full of complacency, uh, the idea of the mother of parliaments and the you know, world beating this and world beating that. It's just not the way the United Kingdom is seen around the world. It just isn't. And even the NHS, which we're all, you know, the NHS saved my life when I was a child and I've got family who, who worked in it. I love it. I think it's a wonderful institution, but it's not the envy of the world in the sense that people haven't copied it and they haven't copied it because it's underfunded. It's not actually very well organized, even though the people who do the business that you and I meet are wonderful. So there's a terrible complacency uh, rooted in Westminster that the Westminster system is somehow loved around the world and everybody, you know, there are very few countries that have an unelected upper chamber as we have. There are not very many countries in Europe who, where, as, as the current government has, 43.6% of the people voted for them, but they get a massive majority of 80 seats. This is a kind of odd way to run a country in the 21st century by looking back to things that were invented in the time of the horse and cart. And I think that, for me at least, and I think for many people, is the root of the problem. And the root of the problem, because as the, the English exceptionalism drives policy, which is purported to be UK policy or you know, affects the whole of the UK, the fact of the matter is there's very little the system can do unless it's reformed to, to counter that, unless, of course, we have an English parliament. Well, there, there are various things that could, that could happen. Um, but there is such a degree of inertia and complacency that I'm not holding my breath that many of them will happen. Uh, going back to the 19th century uh, and, and Joseph Chamberlain and uh, the, the suggestion of home rule for all nations took forever to try to deliver home rule for, for Ireland because it was constantly uh, blocked in the House of Lords in particular. And it was too late. And then, of course, what happened was 1916 and the rebellion and all the bloodshed and the Irish Civil War and the Anglo-Irish War and so on. Uh, so if countries do not continually think about reinventing themselves, really quite bad things are happening. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting all kinds of doom and gloom about that, but I am suggesting that, uh, well, to quote George Osborne, who suggested that the only way to stop Scotland getting in, uh, voting for independence was to stop Scotland voting. And that's from a former chancellor of the United Kingdom. If that's the best case you can make for unionism, that don't let people in Scotland vote to stay or to leave, it's not a really positive vision of the future. And that's what I've been trying to look for. And I'd be very happy to, to hear what that positive vision is from people. I mean, going back to the, the idea of English na nationalism, and a, a case you make in the book, I think, is that the English have for years been somewhat hazy uh, about uh, what it is. Do you think they've come to a conclusion? Do you, uh, is, have you learned, do you think that there is an English identity now uh, beyond, obviously, the, the, the notion of Brexit, which was perhaps a symptom rather than, than any kind of explanation of what's, what, how they regard themselves? Well, there's, there's a very strong English cultural identity, and I love it. I mean, I studied English literature at university. I quote a lot of uh, English scholars and writers uh, approvingly. But even then, it's been kind of bedeviled by what I call nostalgic pessimism. The idea in England in particular, I mean, all, all nationalisms have a bit of this, but in England yeah. in particular, there's always been the sense that things were better in the past and that uh, they can only get worse. And that, one, one of those who writes about that is Shakespeare and John of Gaunt, 
Richard II, this great speech about the sceptered isle and how wonderful England is and the, the sea is a bulwark against, against all these foreign enemies when, when England was very worried about the Catholic Spanish uh, armadas and so on. And yet, if you read that to the end, John of Gaunt says, but we're not as good as we used to be. And this is written in 1595, and it's quoting somebody from the 14th century who, by the way, was a Belgian. John of Gaunt was Jean de Gaunt. He was from Ghent, what we now call Belgium. So, uh, I mean, I love it. It's the most, you know, it's the most wonderful patriotic speech, but it contains at its heart a kind of, um, as I say, nostalgic pessimism, which runs through actually a lot of our, our, our culture today. And that Brexit, for example, is very similar in the sense that we lost something. There's something, something really quite indefinable that was better in the past and we've got to take it back. Well, I'm not quite sure how that works in the 21st century. A reminder to people we're discussing uh, Gavin Esler's book, How Britain Ends. Um, and G Gavin, uh, which I should say, by the way, is available at uh, the Weektown online bookstore, uh, if uh, you're inspired to buy it from, uh, from, from this discussion. The other thing I wanted to, to, to allude to that was in terms of going forward, that do you see you have traveled all over the country, you continue to, to, to meet a lot of different people all over the place, not just because you've got family links, but because, you know, this is what you do when you're, you're, you're writing and you're, you're doing books. Have you come across any evidence that um, there is any support in England for a separate parliament, say, to Westminster? Because, as I recall, uh, when they last voted on this, the, they turned down English devolution, didn't they? Yes, I mean, there's a number of things that we've had an opportunity to to uh, talk about, including a proportional representation. Uh, the, the, the problem, I mean, essentially what I, I hope I do in the book is lay out our different nationalisms and, and talk about our, the, 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 how they compete in a sense. Mm. And to suggest that one possibility might be a kind of federal federal solution of some sort. Uh, where you give more power to the Scottish and Welsh parliaments and to, to Northern Ireland. Admittedly, they're all slightly different, but they're all elected on a better system than Westminster, that you have proportional representation and you rethink whether um, uh, what the role of the parliament in Westminster should be. Now, uh, there has been some support, there is some support for an English parliament, but to have an English parliament competing with the Westminster parliament raises, raises all kinds of issues. What we do have though, most certainly, and I think it's very interesting how coronavirus has played out, mm. that we're familiar with um, you know, Nicola Sturgeon's views of, of how things should proceed and at what time it has been slightly different from Boris Johnson's views. The same for Arlene Foster in Northern Ireland, the same for Mark Drakeford in Wales. But what's interesting is some of the big English cities have said, well, that's that thing that you're saying, that might work in London, but here in and Greater Manchester or Liverpool or Birmingham, perhaps we could do things differently. So we've got, one of the things I say in the book is that we have federalized by stealth. We have, we have not, we have no formalized constitution. We have, we have got, a, we have actually got a written constitution in the sense that it's all there somewhere and written down in different bits and pieces, but people argue about which bits are more important than others and it's not been codified. There's no thing, if you're an American, you want to find, well, if any of our, anybody watching wants to find out what the American constitution is, you just Google it and you get it. Um, and British scholars have written constitutions for 70 countries around the world, former, former colonies, Germ modern Germany, Iraq, uh, even in, uh, in, the, in the 19th century for uh, the Ottoman Empire for a bit. Um, we haven't written one for ourselves. We haven't codified it. And I love the, there's a lovely quote from the historian uh, Macaulay who says that written constitutions are pure gold. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, uh, unwritten constitutions are pure gold. Written constitutions are like paper money. Well, fine, but we don't, we don't pay for things in pure gold anymore. In fact, we don't even use paper money most of the time, we use plastic. So maybe it's just about time to think if we are gonna stay together as a union, who does what, who's responsible for what, and to give more power to the great cities of England, for example. Just, just one final point on that. Yeah. I was really struck in 2015, the, the results of the 2015 general election were very interesting. And one of the most interesting things was UKIP got 3.8 million votes. They got one seat in parliament at Westminster, Douglas Carswell's seat, and then he quit the party. So 3.8 million voters, most of them in England, 
got nothing. That is not a democratic system that we should be proud of. And I don't certainly don't speak for UKIP. I think they were um, uh, quite misleading about our relationship with Europe. But it is very unfair to UKIP voters who cast their vote and got nothing. That is not a good system. But you, you speak to businessmen and uh, women and, and uh, politicians and that. Have you detected any sense that these feelings are reflected there? Are they, are they aware of this now? Because it seems to me this conversation, uh, which should have been going on for the last <laughs> however many <laughs> decades, um, has barely started. Have you, have you detected any sense amongst uh, politicians that this is something that needs to be sorted or is it too late? Uh I have, I have detected a number of things. I mean, obviously, people in Scotland have thought about this for a very long time, for or against, or, you know, and, uh, you know, if we are going to have the union, what, what should it look like? Uh, should we have devolution? Yes, perhaps. Most people think, think so. Where should it go? If you're a nationalist, um, what is going to be our relationship with the EU? What will be our relationship with England? Because we're not going to be towed off to the North Sea. You know, we're going to have a very strong relationship as Scots with, with England. Um, people in Wales increasingly have been thinking about this. And I notice in the past six months, uh, Yes Cymru have uh, claimed that 33% of Welsh people are now considering independence, or one of the phrases was, we're independence curious, which I thought yeah. was quite amusing. Um, and Northern Ireland people think about it all the time. Yeah. In England, people have not thought about it very much. And if it, Scotland becomes independence, uh, independent, uh, whatever that means, but if it, broadly, if, if the re relationship changes and Faslane has to close and a bunch of submarines with nuclear weapons on it have to go and, you know, I don't know, park up the Thames or somewhere. Uh, and if part of what is currently the United Kingdom were to join the European Union, and people I have talked to say it will be a lot easier now than it was in 2014, because it would be a new accession country, not part of an existing country breaking away. Yeah. Um, that would be a big shock in England. And so part of it is to suggest that people think about it and talk about it. And I do know, I have... Uh, I'm not going to say who, but I, I, I had discussions with uh, two quite prominent conservatives. I've had to talk to some Labour Party groups. I'll be talking to a, a, an independence group in Scotland next week. And, and so people are thinking, people are thinking. Um, but there is a great deal of inertia within the government itself. Uh, and, and part of it is if you have got into power by climbing up a certain ladder, you're not very keen on kicking that ladder away and thinking about other things. And so one of the reasons why constitutional reform to many of us is quite boring and to politicians isn't really very often something they want to talk very much about because it doesn't actually uh, gather many votes until things start going wrong. And I've been suggesting that things have been going wrong in the past decade at least. You talk about a ladder, just to be clear, the, the ladder being what? Uh, uh, the Brexit support going to the Conservative Party. Well, the, the, I mean, the ladder is the, the method of which people are elected to, to Westminster. So if you get if you, if you get up, you get in there through first past the post on White a minority edge. vote, as Tony Blair did. To, you know, we talk about Tony Blair's landslides. He didn't actually get 50 percent of the vote. Uh, you know, Boris Johnson's got another landslide. He didn't get more than 43.6 percent of the vote. So. It's very difficult if you just got into power with all that to say, do you know what, the system's actually rotten because look, I got elected by it, must be great. Yes, and by contrast, of course, in the Scottish Parliament, particularly uh, with the system they use, you can claim what with, with, with greater authority that it reflects the share of the vote. Yeah, and the, of course there are problems with all proportional representation systems, yeah. STV and AM, you know, all those things. Um, but they're all fairer and actually they do tend to work and they work in countries that are doing quite well. One of the places that's doing quite well is Ireland. I'm going to say this on St. Patrick's Day. I mean, the Ireland in 1973, when they joined the European uh, EEC, uh, the precursor of the European Union, at the same time as Britain, was a much poorer country than the United Kingdom. Ireland today, and you can check the figures, GDP per capita is a richer country than the United Kingdom. And it's a country of 5 million people. And that's a very interesting potential model for other smaller countries wishing to join the EU, of which Scotland 
I was going me to say. Me or me, not be a by which, you mean, by which you mean Scotland. <laughs> well, five million people in Scotland. And uh, the reason I'm saying this is I've talked to uh, a, a couple of people uh, who are quite prominent in the Scottish National Party, and Ireland is one of the places that they look to. They, they say, you know, they've got a great relationship with Europe. They've got a per perfectly workable relationship with the United Kingdom. Um, and they've done quite well for themselves. So perhaps we could do it too. And also they would say that Ireland left the United Kingdom in the 1920s under much worse circumstances than anything that could be envisaged now for Scotland. Mm. I'm just gonna, I, I'm looking uh, just to my side here because I'm getting some uh, questions in. So Gavin, I wanted to put one or two, uh, those that I've got. The first one I think uh, I've got here, it says, uh, I understand from your book that you were in Edinburgh on the day of the result of the Brexit vote. What do you make mm -hmm. of the fact that the party with the highest support for Brexit in Scotland was in fact the SNP? Indeed, my, uh, my painter and decorator, a hardcore nationalist, voted conservative in the 2019 general election just to make sure Brexit got done. I don't see a difference between the blue wall Brexiteers and the hardcore Scottish nationalists. They are the left behinds or in American terms, the Rust Belt. <laughs> what did you make of that? <laughs> I think that's quite complicated. I'm not quite sure yes. what, what the, what, what the questioner with, is, you know, is asking. I mean, yes. I do what think. Do you make of the what, fact. What, 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 I, what I do think is, uh, you know, I, I can tell you that a couple of people I know who, who voted in favour of Brexit. One uh, is a guy I, I, I've known for many years, and he is self employed. He's been very successful. He's had quite a few uh, difficulties with his with his business, which he he blamed on on the government, and he didn't vote in general elections. He stopped voting. He just said they don't listen; they're all the same. And he voted for Brexit because he thought this is something they'll have to pay attention to. Now, I don't know whether it's the case of whoever it was that the person that uh, that the questioner was asking about, but there was clearly a big negative vote and a sense that something is not right in this country and it's it's very easy for it seems to me for for some people to blame brussels and it's also very easy for some people in scotland to blame westminster for all the ills of of humanity now it's not obviously it's not quite as as as, as clear cut as that the question is whether what you have done is solving problems or creating problems my view is that brexit creates many more problems and i'm not quite sure what problems it solves Got a question from Keith Lewis here. Uh, it says, I feel as though we're in the middle of a perfect storm. How would you put, compare the quality of the <laughs> how would you compare the quality <laughs> of the current crop of politicians in Parliament in comparison with Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland? Are they held to the same level of standards? There's a oh dear. Right. Well, there's a hospital pass. Um, <laughs> look, <laughs> I I uh, there's some great people in politics. I, I would say that there's some really good people in all the main parties. And I, I know some of them and are friends with some of them and I admire them and may disagree, but they're not disagreeable. They're decent people and they're honest and they don't get up in the morning thinking, how can they tell lies to, to, to get elected? There are also other people in parliament uh, who are particularly at Westminster, which I know, know best. I, I ask myself, uh, and actually I ask in the book, for example, how do you become Chris Grayling? Now, Chris Grayling was a serial failure as a minister. Decent chap, you know, nice guy, not yeah, but he was pretty useless as a justice minister. He messed up the probation service. He didn't, you know, he banned books going to prisoners. And he ended up, as we all know, trying to organize um, post-Brexit transport with a ferry company that didn't have any ferries. And there's, there's some other things too. And the answer is because you're loyal to the party um, because you don't make any trouble and whoever the leader is, you support. So therefore, if you're basically a decent chap, good chap, um, you might get on. And there's others and other parties like that. Now, that to me is a problem. And the two party system at Westminster in particular is very good at doing that because um, by, by, I mean, promoting people beyond the level of competence. So I think there's some really excellent and very smart and incredibly hardworking people at Westminster and also in the Scottish Parliament too, and in Northern Ireland, actually, where I know, I know less about uh, people in the Welsh Parliament. 
but there's others think, who are I'm not. just wondering, uh, just Which to follow up on that. And women. Sorry, yeah, no, just to follow up on that. Do you think that the, the system, as it works in Scotland and Northern Ireland, for that matter, encourages a, a wider variety, more diverse kind of person mm. into politics or not? I do, I do, and you know, I think that I think I think people in Parliament should look like rest, the rest of us. They should be. I'm not saying that should be 50% men and 50% women, but they should be broadly look like the rest of society. It should broadly represent the the, the, the area that they're in, and it tends not to be. And I can tell you, I can give you examples again from both the Labour and the Conservative Party. Uh, uh, from the Conservative Party, I know of one ex MP who rebelled against Boris. Johnson and the kind of terrible uh, mess that he was making in this uh, MP's view of Brexit. And he received lots of phone calls from other MPs saying, you're a good chap and uh, you know we really like you, but we can't come out and support you because the activists in our party would deselect me as, you're, as an MP, so I can't do it. And the same has been true in, in the Labour Party. And in fact, I know one, one MP who said in his constituency, um, because of some of the labor activists um, uh, keeping meetings going till after midnight so that people with jobs would go home so they could pass motions which were not reflective even of labor activists and certainly not reflective of, of uh, uh, the wider labor support, um, they had to rearrange constituency meetings in a hall which closed at 10 o'clock at night so people would actually have to go home. Now, that is not a way to run a democracy, and that's both Labour and the Conservatives. Um, so I, I, think, I think there is a problem because most of us, most of the time, have other things to do than sit in halls and listen to political speeches at midnight. Mm. Uh, just to, on a follow up, I, I think uh, I've been uh, got in touch by Mark Norris, who uh, he says, how much of the risk of British breakup would you say is down to the paucity of high quality politicians in the UK government I know you've 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 covered a little bit of that but do, do you think it's a, a lack of quality that is uh, that is at the root of of the inability it would seem to have this discussion in England that seems to be you know vital if if they want to keep the UK together well, I, th I think as a there's there's a number of factors here but I think the two-party system the the fact that there isn't a sort of spread for so the minority parties, Greens, for example, in, in Scotland, look at the Greens in Germany, I'm not advocating their policies, but I am saying that you, they have to be reflected in some way. UKIP as well. I mean, you know, as I said in 2015, some of them, some of those UKIP MPs would have been held to account had they been in Parliament. So if in a two-party system, you can prosper by being loyal but not very good. You're going to get people who are loyal but not very good, and you're not going to get many really independent thinkers. You know, Gordon Brown tried to get in. Remember the government of all the talents. Yes, Goats, you recall. Yes. And and I thought that was a good initiative. But I talked to one of the um, non-traditional politicians, and he said it's really difficult to get anything done. <laughs> in the system where um, as, a, as a minister, you are confronted with civil servants who basically tell you what to do and try and fill your day with meetings to stop you in his view thinking. Mm. I'm, I'm just looking, uh, interesting, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the, the, the possible reform or how that might look like. And I'm just, um, it says here uh, from James, uh, McClung, I think I've, I hope I've got that name right. How likely do you think it is that further powers will be given to devolved governments when powers they already have are being removed? I think we get the drift. This is as a yeah. result of Brexit with powers coming back from the uh, EU yeah. and not coming back to the devolved administrations, but being, uh, as it were, appropriated by Westminster. Well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good question. I think the answer is it's very unlikely with this government. Uh, however, I would say that Boris Johnson does not have a political philosophy. He mm. has a style. And his style is to have two versions of everything. We've seen it with China. China is both the big bogeyman, apparently, and also the, the, the group of people we have to trade with. We saw it with Brexit. He wrote two versions of what we we're supposed to do about Brexit. We've seen about coronavirus, go to work, don't go to work, eat out, don't go out, all that sort of stuff. He's in two minds about everything. And as far as one can tell, he is very hostile to devolution 
and is unlikely to give more powers. However, it is equally possible that someone will say to him, if you really want to do something to keep the United Kingdom together, you should be very bold and give, for instance, a more fiscal responsibility to the Scottish government and say, you know, you, you want to raise ta taxes hugely? Go ahead, you spend your own money. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not an advisor uh, on this in any way, but what I am saying, I'm saying is that consistency would not be the hallmark of the Johnson administration. So yeah. he could do anything. My guess is he's a gut, he's a centralist. He wants to keep most power for himself and he wouldn't be likely to, to do that. But I think it would be in his best political interest, perhaps, if he believes in the union to do precisely that. I think uh, prior to Anne Hamilton for the first mention of COVID uh, this evening, it's uh, her question is based on that. It's a wider point and quite an interesting one, I think. It says, seems to me that COVID has demonstrated the reality of devolution to the public. I think a point you were making in terms of federalisation uh, by stealth and to Westminster government, UK education, health, transport ministers have taken some time to realise they are English ministers. Do you think Westminster will ever adapt to devolution? Yeah, well, uh, it, if it wants to survive... By the time as, they do, as, will it be independence? <laughs> yes, I was going to say, do you, th do, do, you think that the, <laughs> do you think that dinosaurs are going to adapt mm. to, the, to the changes in the planet? Um, I don't think so, actually. I, 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 I've come up with all kinds of suggestions in the book for things that, that could happen, which is to uh, essentially to recognise that we federalise so much, give away more powers from Westminster, build up these, these, these places where people feel a real identity. If you're in Birmingham, people really feel attached to Birmingham. And so they should, you know, uh, Cornwall, people in Cornwall feel yeah. very attached to being Cornish, great. Um, but it's very unlikely because this is a centralizing government which hangs on to as much power as possible and is not particularly competent. So I, I don't think, we, we don't have a lot of deep thinkers. I mean, this is a government that didn't really think about what Brexit would look like. And then the only way they can get a decision is to set themselves a deadline, which is impossible to meet, and then come up with an agreement, which is they're now trying to unpick. This is not, in other words, a government that thinks beyond the next speech or the next day. And I would say, and people may disagree with this, I would say the same is true of the prime minister, which is one of the reasons he gets in so many scrapes because he'll say almost anything one day, which contradicts what he may have said the day before. And, and therefore it's very, very difficult to predict how he, how he will handle any situation. And apropos our discussion on, on identity and English identity, Ruth Ritchie poses the question, um, do, would you characterise, are you, are you saying the English people are struggling with a massive identity crisis? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think it's, it's, it's like that. I think different individuals feel attached to different things. For instance, um, you know, in, in, in London, uh, I love London. I think London is the, by far the greatest city in Europe. It's just a wonderful, wonderful place. And I can feel like a Londoner and Londoners can feel like Londoners too. And they can also feel uh, that they're of Afro-Caribbean heritage or that they're Scots like me, or I've got an Irish friend who said to me once, um, she, she, she feel, felt like a Londoner like that, but could never be English. So we all have multiple levels of identity, uh, it seems to me, but we've not always had to choose about our identities. And I'm suggesting that uh, Scots have thought about it because they've had to choose to be independent or not. People in Northern Ireland have had to choose whether to be British or Irish or actually the Good Friday's agreements genius is they can be both. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so wonderful. Um, English people have not really had to choose between being English and British, but as the tectonic plates I talked about earlier start to shift, they're going to be forced to think about it. Because it, just to take one other example, I talked to a very senior British diplomat about whether if the United Kingdom were to uh, change and Scotland were to become independent and Northern Ireland were perhaps to join the Irish Republic, would Wales and England still have a seat on the permanent five of the uh, Security Council of the United Nations? And the answer is almost certainly no. I mean, there's no particular reason why that should be inherited because the UK would have ceased to exist. So all these th things would be 
quite shocking, I think, to many in the English uh, in the English public because they haven't haven't really had to think about it. And I'm suggesting that thinking about it would be a good idea now before it actually happens, and and you're dragged into it and unwillingly. I think you touched on this a little earlier, and you certainly uh, go into it in some depth in in the book. To what extent do you think? Uh, English identity and, and nationalism is linked to the issue of, of being anti-immigrant? Well, uh, for some people it is. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think we should, we should say, I mean, na all nationalisms have problematic bits, uh, and that is when they other people, which is they say uh, in Germany uh, in the 30s, uh, the, the other was Jewish people, or people of uh, Slavic descent and so on. Uh, and it's true of all, national, all, all nationalisms that there's always a problem fringe. However, I would say that one of the overt tests in terms of politics is whether a government and a political system is broadly welcoming of migrants or otherwise. And the Scottish system has been very welcoming of migrants, very, very welcoming, and it continues to be, and very, very assertive on this point. And in Ireland, um, I talk quite a lot about Sinn Féin and the IRA because I was there during the Troubles and I know people who were the men of violence. I'm, uh, you know, I just met lots of them. And although those who were in the IRA loathed the British Army's presence, I did not feel as a Scottish Protestant of Ulster Protestant Unionist heritage ever any threat to me based on some kind of racism. Maybe we had political arguments. So I'm interested to know when I talk to Irish friends that for instance, Sinn Féin, which could, since it means we ourselves or ourselves alone, could have been an anti-immigrant party. It's not. And I'm, I don't, I don't, not a supporter, I don't speak for them at all. But neither Ireland nor Scotland has a significant anti-migrant party and quite the opposite is very welcoming. In England, some, yeah, some might argue, however, they don't have a serious immigrant problem in the way that some English people seem to define it. Well, they don't. They they don't have an immigrant well, advantage I mean, problem, of having all yeah. these talented people. I know. I know what you. I know what you're saying, Andy. But but yeah. in England, what we have is a, a, a quote hostile environment declared on people who have migrated to 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 the United Kingdom and ludicrous stunts. In the previous government of Theresa May, uh, well, when she was Home Secretary, uh, there were vans going around London saying, if you're here illegally, go home. Now, who was that aimed at? Who was that aimed at? That was not aimed at migrants. That was aimed at British people, English people, to say we're doing something about migration. So it's been whipped up very much by the political mainstream, by the Conservative Party in, in England, in a way which it's not. Uh, true in, in Scotland and, and, and Ireland. And maybe you're right that there are difficult differences, other differences. But just to take an, another example, I'm Chancellor of the University of Kent. Um, people, farmers in Kent couldn't get people to um, pick their asparagus, pick their cherries and so on. And farmers up and down in, in England uh, were trying to get Romanians to come in to England last year to pick fruit because they couldn't get people to do it. So there's a very strange relationship with migration, which is we need them, but we want them all to go home. And one of the, one of the, for those people, I suppose they would see it as a benefit of Brexit that many people from uh, the European Union have gone home, at least gone back to their country of origin, partly because the pound has gone down and they're not getting so much money. And some feel, some feel there's been a hostile environment created. Just a reminder, we're talking about uh, Gavin Ersler's book, uh, How Britain Ends, which is available uh, on the online bookshop uh, for uh, on the Wigtown Book Festival site. Also, uh, just a, a passing thought, if you're enjoying tonight and you feel that uh, you want to contribute in some small way to keep uh, the event going, please uh, do consider visiting the Wigtown Book Festival uh, website and consider donating to that. Um, just uh, a question here uh, I've got here. Will there, uh, This is from Marjorie Scott, Gavin. It says, will there, in your view, ever be a politician brave enough <laughs> to instigate con constitutional reform? We've, we've touched on that already a little bit, but as you say, it's, it's not exactly the most raciest of political subjects, is it? It's not very racy. I, I mean, um, uh, I think uh, 
Keir Starmer uh, has suggested that that is something on his agenda. I'm not quite sure how that will play out, but he's certainly thinking about it. Um, and it may be the thing that people recognize, because, because whatever happens now, we're all looking forward to the May elections in Scotland to see what kind of mandate or otherwise uh, parties in favor of independence get. It may be thrust upon uh, the United Kingdom. And I think Keir Starmer has already laid down some markers about it. I noticed Mark Drakeford, who's also Labour, but uh, is the first minister of Wales, has been talking a bit about it. Gordon Brown has suggested uh, his phrase, uh, we risk becoming a failed state if we don't do something. Whether this has got any traction with people who, you know, most of us, most of the time, just want a decent job, want our kids to go to a nice school, want COVID to go away, to be reasonably healthy and to get things to work. But my suggestion throughout the book is that things would work a lot better if we actually planned a bit better how they're actually run and who's in charge of what parts of it. And a question uh, that the receiver says is one of the problems for successive UK governments, and I think we've touched on this a little bit, but not the fact that they can't or won't accept that the UK and the modern world is, uh, as one Russian politician stated, a small island uh, off, off the coast of Europe. I mean, that sort of overinflated view of yourselves in the fact that, you know, uh, you talk in the book about how. Britain, you know, certainly certain aspects of history, we've never been defeated, victorious, glorious, all that sort of stuff. And half of that is, is simply not true. <laughs> but that's, uh, that, that is true. But the other hand, I mean, look, I, one of the things, these islands have produced the most extraordinary people with, with an amazing culture, great literature, fantastic music, incredible talent, um, more... Nobel Prizes to uh, one college in Cambridge than all of China and Japan put together. Uh, hugely intelligent, inventive people. Scotland has produced people who've gone all over the world and made their fortunes and helped create other countries. The same is true of Wales and, and, and the people in Ulster and, and, and the Irish Republic too. So in many ways, there are such extraordinary strengths as a problem solving people. And we have got soft power in the sense of some of our institutions uh, around the world are the envy of the world. But our political system has become utterly complacent about how it's regarded. And also we have botched, I'm afraid, in the past five years, so many things that the way in which we are seen around the world is not the way that we see in the echo chamber of some newspapers and, and politics. Just to give you a couple of examples, I mean, I quote in the book, a German magazine doing a profile of Jacob Rees-Mogg and saying, um, you know, some people, he's, he's sort of heart and soul of the Conservative Party, he is also uh, das Leben des Fossil, the living fossil. Um, so it, it, this was as part of an article of, of how, how we are viewed. In America, the New York Times has been utterly scathing about Britain in the last couple of years. I mean, just in a way in which if you were an American reading it, you would think that we were a banana republic without the bananas. Now, we're, we're not. We're much better than that, whatever our difficulties and wherever we end up. But the idea that we are somehow, you know, all around the world, just to take one other example, I am a huge fan of the NHS, I've said before. Um, I was three weeks old and I was saved by an operation in a hospital in Glasgow, otherwise I would have died. Right. But I've also got German relatives who are doctors. And when I say to them, you know, people think that the NHS is the envy of the world, they say, which people? Um, every year you have a beds crisis. Every winter, forget COVID, you have a beds crisis. You have a beds crisis because you've got, I think it's 2.5 beds for a thousand people. We've got eight point something or other, it's like three or four times as much. We spend more money on health, but we've got a better system. Now we can argue about that, but what we can't argue about is that if we think that everything that we do in terms of institutions is the envy of the world, we are really unfortunately deluding ourselves. And following on from that, uh, David Ralston asks, are there other countries then from whom we can learn how to adjust to our new reality, as it were, post-empire? Um, he suggests perhaps the Netherlands, but uh, are there other countries we can learn from to adapt our new role, as it were? 
Well, the, I think the Netherlands is a, is a very interesting example. I mean, uh, in universities, for example, I know a number of British students who go into Dutch universities because they get teaching in English. Uh, uh, there are a number of um, financial and other institutions, and the, I think the European uh, Medicines Agency has gone to, to Amsterdam, who are going over there because they are genuinely multilingual and they are genuinely a player in Europe. And, and there's Global Netherlands as well, I suppose. Whereas we talk about it, but actually, how many of us actually speak a foreign language fluently? Okay. So what, what is this Global Britain? We're gonna to talk to the Americans again. Um, we, we, have, we have a series, of, how many people actually speak Mandarin in the United Kingdom? Not very many. So we can learn from other countries and the Netherlands would, would, be a, would be a good example. And there are other less good examples that we could learn from, which is uh, how, how Spain having lost an empire went, became a rather dull backwater for quite a while. Although nowadays it's, it's slightly different because of its relationship with Europe and having thrown off um, the yoke of fascism. So we can learn from other countries, but we can learn from ourselves. We, we, have, we have so many smart, people who could actually figure out where we're going we've got a, uh, questions coming in so i just want to see if we can fit in a couple more because we are approaching uh, the end of our time but uh, one more specific and one perhaps looking ahead one very specific question do you <laughs> do you think boris johnson will be able to deny the s p a referendum if they win a majority in may on their own or in alliance with the scottish greens what's your sense well for for, formally, he could he could do that. Uh, the question is whether that is either wise or really truly democratic. If it's the express will of the Scottish people, and my my view is that if people want a, ref, a referendum, they should have, and maybe we should we should thrash out these issues and try to figure which way to go. And the, perversely, the more he denies it, it seems to me, the more likely it is that people will become thrown and scunnered. <laughs> <laughs> good words yes good stuff I can words. translate for anybody who doesn't understand it but i think most people will understand I think most people would understand. i'm very thrown and i can be scunnered by some of the things i've seen in westminster too so uh i think it would be if if again i don't, certainly don't advise him but i would be interested to see if he is persuaded that he has to grant it at some point and then tries to set the parameters of it which make it very difficult for nationalists that would be possible uh, would, wouldn't be entirely surprising. And I would like to end on possibly the most difficult question of all, but one which I think might be quite interesting, to look forward. Uh, uh, Campbell uh, uh, Hornell has asked, what do you think the UK will look like in 30 years' <laughs> time, in 2050? Will it or still 20, exist? 2050, right. Will it still exist? Uh, I, well, it won't look like it looks like now. So either they really will try to uh, figure out, by they, I mean Westminster governments, uh, what the relationship should be like in these islands, change it, have a sensible kind of user's manual for the United Kingdom called a constitution, like, like modern countries, get rid of the House of Lords, uh, absolutely just get rid of it. If they, want to have a, if they want to have a social club, charge them for it, make them pay for it, let them, let them buy, you know, lordships or whatever it is, peerages, as long as the money goes to the taxpayer. Um, uh, and give more seriously, uh, give people, particularly in England, more say over their own affairs in different places and allow Scotland to have either more devolution, more powers or independence, if that is the will of the, the Scottish people. That's, that's the benign scenario, it seems to me. The malign scenario is constant delay, not really thinking about it, finding it happens anyway, and happens in a very, very bad fashion, where nobody, particularly in England, is particularly prepared for it, and it's a real shock. I hope that doesn't happen, because as I say, there are so many people who are problem solvers all across the UK, so many decent people in all the main political parties, actually, who could get together and sort out some of this. I'm always hopeful but not particularly optimistic on on this i'm afraid 
An interesting note on, on A Witch to End. We've been talking about Gavin Esler's book, How Britain Ends. Uh, we've come to the end of our time. I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us uh, for supporting Wigtown Wednesday. And thank you uh, for all of your questions. I hope uh, that some of them and many of them have been addressed to your satisfaction. Don't forget to support future events. Thank you very much indeed for joining. And most of all, Gavin Esler, thank you very much indeed for sparing the time to join us. Thank you, Andy, and thank you everyone for watching. Thank you.